So, um, good evening, everybody. And I'm really delighted to see some of your faces on the screen. And um, we have some people from First Church and we have some people from elsewhere. And we are delighted that Will Brownsberger, our state senator for Belmont um, and Enverance are is with us here um, to give his uh, perspective on the work that he's been doing for so many years on um, redistricting redistricting. So um, with I don't think Will needs more of an introduction. So I think without further ado, I'm going to turn this program to Will. And he, he said before, and I'm going to repeat that, of course, um, if you'd like to ask him a question, just go ahead and do that by interrupting. And I'm going to ask you to mute yourself if you're not speaking so that um, everybody is, in fact, um, not going to distract everyone else by background noise. So, um, okay. So, Will, take it away. Well, th thank you. Thank you for having me. When I joined the, um, it was, it was, let's see, 20, 2019, January 2019, when the new Senate president, Kara Spilka, sort of decided how she wanted to configure her team and uh, gave me the title president pro tem, which means whatever she wants it to mean, means I help her out. Um, and, uh, and then, and she gave, and she asked me to chair the redistricting uh, committee. And um, I had um, not really given any thought to the issue of redistricting. Um, and so I had a lot of, a lot to learn actually. It turns out redistricting is a really fascinating process. It's fascinating uh, because you, get to talk to every senator about how they do their job and what they what they care about. Uh, you get to talk to um, you know all, all the folks all across the Commonwealth with their particular political concerns that they're trying to advance uh, through the redistricting process. And it's just actually really fascinating uh, technically and technologically and most importantly, it's it's pretty deep legally and you know deep enough that it really touches fundamental constitutional principles. And it took me, the, the hardest part of it all was understanding the relevant law. Um, I'll tell you the, the, the challenge is it says, basically the law is you won't think about race at all when you redistrict, but you will think about race. And, uh, and so, and figuring out what exactly what that means uh, is, is kind of the conundrum of, of, of the process. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll break that out, down a little bit so that, um, so that you can, I'll show you the insight that it took me a couple of years to, to kind of get my head around uh, in the process. And I think, I think what we did over the past couple of years, um, this is something of course that the Commonwealth has to do every 10 years. Uh, when the census comes down, our constitution requires that when the, census, the federal census comes down, we redraw our districts to accomplish the fundamental goal of equal, equal size. Um, but, uh, off. Hi. Um, I don't know who's whose speaker is on, but um, would be helpful to mute yourself. Thank you. The so it's been. It, let me let me let me sort of start talking about about the process. I the, let's talk about it from from the bottom up. The, the, there's several basic ideas in our constitution. Obviously, um, we have a government by the people, for the people, of the people. Um, and that idea is, of course, fundamental to redistricting. Redistricting is all about the voting process. Um, and by the way, it's, of course, we have to redistrict at multiple levels. We have to redistrict for Congress. That's the thing that gets the most national attention. We have to redistrict for each of the branches of the state legislature. Um, and we also have to redistrict for the governor's council, which people don't pay as much attention to. And then of course we redistrict in each municipality and the principles are basically the same uh, at, at each level. Uh, but when redistricting in, at the municipal level is just redrawing the precincts, which the, the town of Belmont, if you're a town meeting member, you, you're aware of, uh, the town of Belmont has had to redraw its precincts, but it's basically the same principles at every level. So the number one principle um, is, is equal protection. 
Now, if you remember, if you think about the, the Civil War amendments of, to the Constitution, which to me are sort of the, the heart of the Constitution, you know, that what we did in 1776 was very, very important. But what we did in 1865 uh, is what's really sort of the issues that are played through a lot of the rest of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the last last century and a half. Um, we, Lincoln said no more slavery and you won't deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law that no state shall do that. In other words, you're, you know, this, it put a supervisory view over state governments and that was in response to uh, all kinds of abuses by southern, southern, uh, you know, defeated southern governments against their the newly uh, citizen former slaves, um, but then the key clause is: we shall not deny to any person within its jurisdiction. The state will not de deny to any per person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws. So, not only are you not going to do bad things to an individual but you're going to treat every class in an even way. You're gonna equally protect all races. Uh, you're not gonna use any other suspect classification to give differential treatment. So the first way that the equal protection clause plays into the redistricting idea, to the redistricting process, is that every district has to be more or less the same size in terms of population. That's sort of obvious, right? We take that more or less for granted, but you know what? That's not what they were doing in the, in, in, in the South and perhaps some other places, uh, you know, in the early part of this century, there were districts that had, you know, large districts, let's say with a minority population, and then much smaller districts with white populations. So you had the white folks got a lot more legislators than the black folks. So if you have, you know, a, a place of 200,000 people and you put 100,000 in a black district and 20,000 20, in each of five white districts, same number of people, but a different number of representatives. So that, that was, there were court decisions that happened in the, in the 60s that said, thou shalt not do that. Districts have to be the same size. And the way those decisions have evolved over the past few decades say that congressional districts have to be very close to the same size. Some people have interpreted the precedents to say they have to be exactly equal, and that's the approach we've taken. So based on the 2020 census, as of April 1st, whatever that the census figured out that number was, those districts are equal as of then, which is sort of an absurd thing, right? I mean, because things are changing. Uh, then, you know, the next day they're not equal, uh, but we... Um, followed the conservative precedent there to make them exactly equal. Fortunately for state legislative districts, because they're smaller, the court precedent gives us a plus or fi minus 5% tolerance uh, in, in size. So what's the ideal size? If we've got a a 40 senators and there's 7 million people, then it's 175,000 is the ideal size, plus or minus 5%, which is plus or minus about 8,000 people. Um, that's the range of allowable sizes for Senate districts. Similar computation for the House districts. And by the way, similar, similar computation for the precincts in Belmont. So that's idea number one is equal size. And here's the next big idea, which doesn't really um, get it, a, enough attention in the public discourse about redistricting but it's very fundamental. Thou shalt not include an area in a district or remove an area from a proposed district primarily or predominantly based on the racial mix of that area. Thou shalt not engage in racial sorting as you redistrict. We don't have black districts and white districts, just like we don't have black swimming pools and white swimming pools, black schools and white schools, black counters and white counters, black drinking fountains and white drinking fountains. Thou shalt have, thou shalt not sort by race. 
Uh, and that is a very important principle of the Supreme Court. And that comes from that principle of, of preserving equal protection. Now, so therefore, when I first came into this, I'm going, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get a data set. I'm gonna set up like a clean team that doesn't know what the race of anything is, you know, that doesn't have racial data on the computer. And um, then we'll have somebody else look at race to tell us whether we violate the Voting Rights Act, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Obviously that's an impossible plan for me because people are always talking to us about race. And so we know, we, and we know a lot about race. And so we can't really put it out of our mind entirely. And we're not required to, you know, just it's understood, of course, that people are aware of race in the redistricting process, it, race and ethnicity, but um, we're not supposed to be doing it predominantly based on race unless, unless we have a, this, we have a compelling reason to do so. And what have the courts recognized as a compelling reason to redistrict based on race? I'm gonna ask that to the group. What would you think? What, in what circumstances would the courts allow us to redistrict based on race? Uh, hi, Will. Well, I would say if redistricting happened and uh, uh, some group of people were excluded from from being represented. So that's exactly certain, yeah. That, certain that's, race that's, group was excluded. Yeah. Or or maybe or maybe uh, you know some genius would decide to take the black population, for example, and distribute them over enough different districts so that their votes really didn't matter. So those are those are both the right idea. Um, and the what what you just said, uh, Bill. Yeah, Bill. Another uh, Will. Is, thank you. Uh, is um, is what's referred to as cracking. Uh, is you you there if if previously, you know if if the plan on, on the existing plan has the effect of den or or a proposed plan could have the effect of denying a majority group a minority group the ability to elect the candidate of their choice then we can make a so-called narrowly tailored response to avoid that outcome. So the challenge is to understand is what, what, what exactly what circumstances do we consider that somebody has, um, the, the a minority group has been deprived of the, of the ability to elect the candidate of their choice. Well, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as amended, gives us, a, and, and then as interpreted repeatedly by the Supreme Court, gives us a clear framework for deciding that. And it's a three-part, it's a three-step thing. And that's the key idea, and under, I'm going to tell you what those steps are, but, but, you know, this dilemma that says, don't think of race, do think of race, the way to think about it, it's a process. You're going to go through certain steps to determine whether you should think about race, and then you're going to do that if you should, and you're not if you if you shouldn't. Um, and you're going to be aware that if you didn't have a very obvious reason for thinking about race for redistricting based on race, then you're potentially in trouble. So the steps are: number one, is it is there an area of the you know geographic area, a reasonably ge compact geographic area, not a ridiculous salamander. And you'd be amazed at, you know, listen, people talk about the salamander and the gerrymander and, you know, this sort of odd like, grouping of towns that sort of snakes around a little bit. Some of the districts that have been drawn are, are just like, they're like snowflakes. I mean, they're just ridiculous things that have no compactness whatsoever to them. But um, step one, if you have a reasonably compact area in which the given major minority is a majority of a voting range population. So if I'm looking at a Senate district, 175,000 people, do I have a place where, you know, more than half of that, whatever that is, 87.5, you know, roughly more than 90,000 people of the area in this area are Black. And I'm saying Black. Um, by the way, the um, Voting Rights Act only recognizes 
six specific minorities. There's only six minorities that you're going to sort of redistrict by, which are Black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, Asian Pacific Islander, and uh, Alaska Native. You're not, you don't, all the other things that you can imagine, like Irish, Portuguese, Cape Verdean, uh, these are not legal constructs in the in in the law. The Voting Rights Act defines a very narrow set of particular minorities, which in effect there's some remedial work for us to do in this country. Um, and um, so you look at are, are is there are there geographically areas in which a particular minority is a majority? And that's something you can see very easily on the map. You know, you you tune up the the colors on the map to show areas where there's a density of minority population and you zero in on those and you, you look at the size, can you draw a district around them? And so in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that's a pretty straightforward exercise. There's only certain areas uh, where you can do that. And um, let me tell you what the next steps are before I talk about some of those areas. The first I decide, do those areas ex exist? Second, I say, I have to do a political analysis. I have to say, do the minority voters in that possible district, do they vote as a block? In other words, we, if we're worried about denying them their choice, as a group, do they have a choice? And so you have to do some pretty sophisticated statistical analysis because we don't know who voted for who. You know, if I've got a district that's 50% black and 50% white, and it voted 80% for candidate X, well, what do the black voters do? What do the white voters do? I don't know. Um, so I have to, so there, but if you look at enough districts, you get you get a pat of enough precincts, you get a pattern, and there's a thing called ecological inference, um, and I'll, it's a fancy word. Um, Markov chain, Monte Carlo simulation analysis, and you know, it takes a while to run on the computer, but it does produce um, some, 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 I think, very legitimate insight as to what the patterns of voting are. And if there's a clear pattern that looks like most of the black voters are voting for um, Kim Janey in the mayor's race, as they did, black voters in Boston voted for Kim Janey, overwhelmingly. Other voters didn't. Uh, and so she didn't get elected. Um, but Kim Janey was the candidate of black choice in the mayor's race. Um, now, then the next question, the third of three questions is, do the white voters, I'm saying white, the surrounding voters, vote as a block against the minority candidate? And in the case of Kim Janey, yes, they did. Um, interestingly enough, everybody voted for um, most people, most, most, most ethnic groups, certainly Hispanic and Asian, uh, and well, basically all the major ethnic groups voted for Michelle Wu, except for uh, the black group. Um, if the blacks were, uh, were capable of electing, would, would be otherwise capable of electing the candidate of their choice, you know, if they were big enough in Boston, they're not big enough in the city as a whole. So there's no Voting Rights Act issue in that outcome, but um, that would be block voting against the black, candidate. Now, you don't just look at one election. You look at as many elections as you can find, and you look at the elections that most resemble the one that you're analyzing. So if I'm looking at Senate races, uh, you know, I'm, I'm redistricting for the Senate. I want to look at legislative races because people, the people who come out in a legislative race to vote are very different from the people who come out in a, just a local election or, or a national election. You have to look at the, the kind of people who are going to vote in a, in a legislative race and those are the folks that you want to look at the, the patterns for. So the Senate race is going to be the most pro of election of a Senate for when you're trying to analyze voting behavior in a potential Senate race. Um, another thing that would make that would make an election very probative is if you had a black candidate and a white candidate. It's it's not really very probative to know, hey, who do they vote for? Do they vote as a block for Ed, uh, you know, Ed Markey or Joe Kennedy? I mean, which flavor of vanilla do you want? Um, and so it's, you know, if, 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 your, if your options don't really include um, someone that you might be especially disposed to vote for, then it's not particularly helpful. So you look at a whole lot of races and it's been, it's a, it, we, we had a, a great political consultant working with us 
a woman from, from Tufts, brilliant mathematician, really a pleasure to work with. Uh, you know, what up and coming person. I don't think, I think we were actually the first person that, the first state entity, uh, you know, the first statewide redistricting operation that used her services. Uh, you know, there's, there's a the business of doing this redistricting consultant is dominated by a few old war horses who really do know their stuff. Uh, but we decided we wanted to go with um, someone who was, uh, you know, on the curve upwards, but brought a lot of talent. And I'm glad we did, because uh, I think we got we got some really good analysis done. So those are the three levels. Are there enough? Do they vote as a block? And the, does the rest of the candidates vote against the rest of the voters vote against them in such a way that um, the minority is denied the candidate of their choice? Let me pause there. I've rattled through a bunch of ideas. Did that, did that make sense? I can't see our faces, but please if speak up if I've left anybody baffled. I don't know, it sounded pretty clear to me. And I was delighted to hear that you did consult with Moon Duchin. Is she yeah. the lady with Tufts? Yeah. yeah you know her? I do. She's, you know, has, has done a lot of really detailed analysis of all the different ways that redistricting can produce different results and sort of provides a, a framework and a context for doing it. So I was delighted to hear that you relied on her. Yeah, no, well, we, yeah, we, we learned a lot together. Um, so, all right, so let's take, that's the basic legal framework. Let me, let me, let me outline just a couple more layers. Um, I've talked about the constitutional framework and that is the, that's, that's the layer that matters most, right? Equality of size, non-discrimination and then but recognition that you could possibly deny a group the candidate a minority group the candidate of their choice and thou shalt not do that either um, and there's a process for going through step by step um, the other things once you've done all that then what's then there's still a lot of options on the table you still have a ton of flexibility and a ton of outcomes that are possible um, and the things that you start to talk about there are Number one, continuity. I mean, you don't just, there's a relationship between, you know, elected officials and their constituents, and you don't just scramble that for the heck of it. Uh, you, you, want, you want to preserve that where you can. People are working together on different things. You don't want to just, you know, throw, throw the cards up in the air and let everybody find each other again, some, you know, some other way. Um, so continuity is important. Uh, the other thing that's very important is preservation of municipal boundaries, um, and that was especially that 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 that's especially important in this election cycle because we got the data late, and that created that that forced um, municipalities to be redrawing their precincts at the same time as we were drawing our lines, and that created a lot of potential for conflict. Normally, the municipalities go first. We respect their precinct decisions and how we draw our lines. This year, because we did not get the data until four months late because of COVID and everything else, um, we had to go at the very same time. And we actually said, look, you guys go after us. Um, and so we didn't want, with it, from the Senate perspective, we knew that we were creating problems, potential problems. Every community we split, we were creating potential uh, crisscrossing situations of our lines and their lines. And so we, we, we worked hard to minimize the number of communities that we split. We brought that down from uh, 22 in the last redistricting to, or no, from 21 down to 11. Um, and that was, that, that involved making some tough decisions that, that uh, changed the world in ways that a few people weren't happy with, uh, but it also saved a lot of potential conflict. The House of Representatives, smaller districts, they, they, they cut up something like 90 communities and that's, you know, a bunch of bunch of little problems in the wake of that. Um, after that, you're really into soft territory in terms of your criteria. It's resemblances and do this, does this belong with this? So, you know, is this a regional school district? Uh, do, does everybody live on one side of the railroad tracks? If you get into a lot of very discretionary considerations after you get beyond the ones I've just outlined. So, what were the big stories in this redistricting cycle for Massachusetts against that background of principle? Number one, um, the equality of size was a big story because Massachusetts had very uh, 
different patterns of growth. The population in the western part of the state actually declined uh, during the decade. So you had loss of population out in Berkshire County. And then some other areas grew much faster than others. The fastest growing areas were it, it, around Boston, um, so especially sort of immediately north of Boston, um, you know, Cambridge, Somerville, Chelsea, that, uh, Everett, that whole, that, that whole general area is, was the highest growth. But generally, Middlesex County and, and areas in the eastern part of the state were growing. Um, and by the way, when I say the, the, that characterization of things is based on uh, all the projections we had, because we had to do a lot of our thinking. We weren't going to wait until the data came and then start thinking. We, we used the available projections that we had, did, you know, did a whole lot of scenarios before the actual data came out. Um, and in those scenarios, it seemed like it might make sense to lose a seat in Western Mass. And, you know, instead of having uh, 10 senators from Worcester to the, to the West, bring it down to nine and surface, it cre create a seat in Boston. Um, ultimately, um, we didn't do that because the final data came back differently. It looked like that would be less disruption but ultimately, there, the, there was a very significant amount of unexpected growth in the Worcester County area. And actually, Berkshire County suddenly didn't look as bad as it did um, coming in. I, I honestly think that that was, there was just a whole bunch of people that, you know, New Yorkers who said, you know what, um, I'm leaving the Manhattan and I'm just going to stay up here uh, through this COVID ep epidemic. And so on April 1, where do you live? I live in Berkshire County. Uh, there was there was kind of an exodus there because we had the same thing on the Cape, but the Cape, the Cape had a big unexpected uh, period of growth or, or you know uh, registered growth as it, this is all of, as of April one, right? So you know we're like three weeks into COVID and you know people people located up there. Uh, that's that's our theory of how that happened uh, because all the all the indicators prior to that were that you were going to have um, you know a little bit of a drop in both of those places. So that was story number one. But the 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 even even with those changes, the growth in Worcester and the, you know a little bit of a recovery in in uh, Berkshire, the western part of the state was down substantially. So we had to move move districts. All the districts in the western part of the state had to physically get bigger and stretch across. And so that the 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 senator kind of immediately west of Worcester had a district that goes from all the way from Connecticut to New Hampshire. And, and so her, all that change had to be mediated through her district. So her district, basically, she lost half her district and gained half a new district. And that was the biggest, one of the biggest changes on the map and, uh, and then ripples across, uh, all across the map. So there was, there was a destabilization of a lot of districts as a result of those uh, population growth differentials. Um, that's story number one. That was, that's a whole series of little adjustments that came out okay in the end. Um, then the next story, when we talk about the, the Voting Rights Act issues, there are only a few places in the state where there are potential, there's a big enough minority population to raise the Voting Rights Act issue, and we can talk about each of them. Springfield is interesting because that in Springfield, we already, it was already a pretty Hispanic district the way it was drawn in 2010. And um, as a result, it has a Puerto Rican senator. And so we really didn't change much there. We, we improved the district uh, based on the traditional ideas of reducing split communities and um, you know, compactness of the district, trying to just improve the appearance of the district overall. So it is a better district, but it's not different from a Voting Rights Act standpoint. We didn't make our decisions there based on Voting Rights Act considerations. Um, Worcester, interestingly enough, does not have a big enough minority population to engage Voting Rights Act concerns, if you're talking about the Senate districts. Um, Chelsea, the Chelsea, Lynn, Revere area has a very big Hispanic population, but it, that Hispanic population there is different from the Hispanic population in Springfield. In Springfield, the Hispanic population is heavily Puerto Rican, US citizens. Um, in, Lawrence, Hispanic population is mostly Dominican, but they've been there a while. So they're mostly US citizens. In Chelsea, Lynn Everett, you've got a lot of new Central American immigrants who are not US citizens, cannot vote, and they don't count 
if you're trying to do that that first step of saying, do, are there enough in the district that could be part of the voting population? So you could, if they were citizens, you'd have a, a, a potential Hispanic district to consider there, but they're not, uh, so you don't. Um, Brockton is an interesting area. Brockton's a very interesting area. It does not quite make any racial majority, um, you know, any minority majority. It has a big population um, that um, is, has a very diverse population, but they're not, there's no one minority. And that's the way the Voting Rights Act thinks as interpreted by the Supreme Court increasingly. That's a sort of ambiguous area. Can you combine minorities? Is there a coalition district? Very complicated. Bottom line is no, not really, uh, not for Voting Rights Act purposes. Um, but we'll talk about what we did in Brockton uh, in a minute. The two places where there was real Voting Rights Act considerations were in Boston and Lawrence. Two different stories. Boston is a, is a, is a very historic thing. Actually, it's, it's kind of poetic that we're talking about this today because Bill Owens, who was the first black senator for Boston, just died. But in 1973, Bill Owens and uh, Ed Markey and uh, a bunch of other people uh, were agitating for the creation of a black Senate district. And that actually, yeah, I think Ed Markey was there. I know, I, now, you know what? Yeah, yeah, he was there. I think he came in with Bill Owens. Bill Owens was a state rep. The Senate, the Boston was carved up. The Senate districts in Boston were carved up so as to preserve seats for a number of white senators, mostly Irish and then a couple of Jewish senators. Um, and so you had, you had sort of big Jewish populations. A lot of them had migrated down to the South Shore. So you had these districts that kind of stretched with a, you know, a chunk of Boston and stretched down to the South Shore. Same for a lot of, a lot of the Irish population. Um, you know, you have like South Dorchester and then you go down to you know, Weymouth and so forth. Um, those kind of it, it, like fingers of a hand, these districts stretching down out of Boston and it still kind of looks like that. Uh, but the, um, the core of it, the, 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 there was this, uh, there was a black, there was a potential black district there and they weren't drawing it. They were dividing it up and the Senate refused to draw it. They sent a plan to the governor that didn't redraw the districts and the governor vetoed it, which is, you know, that, I, I don't believe that's happened. I don't probably didn't have, hasn't happened in any, you know, in the, in the entire past century. Uh, I, I'm not aware of it. And I did, I have looked over quite a bit of the history. Um, that's the only time that the governor vetoed the plan. So Frank Sargent, Republican, vetoed this uh, plan that didn't divide, that did not create a black seat in the Senate. In the House, and then what happened is normally it's a very routine thing, right? That, you know, we always override the governor's veto on, you know, something that, you know, the, the Senate intends to do and the, the House intends to do and the House and Senate respect each other. House, the Senate re approves the House plan, the, the House approves the Senate plan. So what happened was the... Um, the Senate went ahead and approved the House, you know, um, approved the House plan, and that was done. And then the House refused to override the governor's veto on the Senate of the Senate plan. Most House members did vote to override, but you had a coalition of progressive re legislators, Republican legislators, Black legislators, and angry legislators that just might vote against anything leadership wanted. Uh, but and you, and you put those groups together and it was enough to sustain the governor's veto. They needed two thirds. They couldn't get the two thirds to, to override the governor's veto. So they forced the Senate to create a black district, which the Senate did in, 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 in 1973, created the district that, you know, sort of Dorchester, Roxbury district. And that district was Bill Owens was the first guy and then Royal Bowling and then Diane Wilkerson. Diane Wilkerson served starting in 1993. In 2000, the Senate got creative and they said, you know, we, we think there's enough black voters um, and voters, other voters of color. And by the way, in 2000, that idea of coalition voting as a Voting Rights Act issue was in vogue uh, and, and, and sustained by some appellate courts. Um, and there was a belief that it that would happen, that in fact, different minority groups would vote as a coalition. Um, and so this, this, they created two districts. They said, you know, we can create two districts. So now you have a 
Boston, a Boston district that's sort of Dorchester and South Boston uh, and you know the areas of, of Boston that are on the coast, and that's the first Suffolk district. And then you had a district that was Jamaica Plain, Roxbury, and, and sort of Hyde Park, Rosendale, and that was the second Suffolk. And they basically divided the black community right down the middle. So to Bill's vocabulary earlier, they in, arguably they cracked the black community, but they thought they had enough voters in both districts to um, elect, continue for the black community to elect the candidate of their choice or for some kind of coalition to elect the candidate of their choice. But what happened was that pretty soon Diane Wilkerson got beat. I mean, she remained the black candidate of choice, but other, other voters voted for Sonia Shang Diaz um, and beat and got rid of Diane. Um, and then in, in, we did have one black, and that's in the second Suffolk. In the first Suffolk, we did have a black uh, senator in, in, who got elected in 2013, but the only way she got elected was she had everything going for, uh, married to the, um, you know, the head of a Dorchester newspaper, and the white vote was split. There were two candidates out of South Boston. That's the only way she won. Without that split, she would have lost, despite being one of the most charismatic candidates you can imagine. Uh, really, Dor Linda Dorsina Fori, I don't know if you know her, but she is an extremely dynamic person. Um, and at the, you know, she could get elected anywhere with, with the things, you know, with the things that she had going for, but not there because the, the white voters voted as a block against her. Um, so uh, when I came, started the redistricting process, I saw that right away that, look, I've got the black community, it's been cracked. And we did the political analysis um, really rigorously, we looked really hard at the Boston elections, reached the conclusion that yes, black voters were being divided, de denied the candidate of their choice. And we created a black district, we, we adjusted it, we, we did that, we're supposed to um, uh, narrowly tailor is the phrase our, uh, our, our change to accomplish the goal of making sure that the minority could elect the candidate of their choice. By the way, it's it's, it's, it's about the black voters getting their candidate of choice, not about electing a black candidate. Those turn, may turn out to be the same thing, but they should be elect, able to elect the candidate of their choice. And um, about the voters, not the candidates. But we did create a black district uh, where, where there, they are a majority. And uh, where I think you're gonna see, we're gonna have a black Senator from Boston in 2021 and 2023. Um, and I'm excited about that. You know, there's, there's, there's a, a, an interesting race evolving several state reps have stepped up to the plate. And I, you know, that's, um, we did that. Uh, we feel good about that. Um, the, um, the other story, which is really, which is a different story. It's a fascinating story up in Lawrence. In Lawrence, um, Lawrence until this cycle did not have a sufficient number of citizen Hispanic voters within a compact area to uh, elect to 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 meet that fifty percent plus one criterion, you have to have fifty percent, um, and less than that, you cannot engage in in racial voting, racial racial district drawing. You have to pass that first threshold, honestly, at the fifty percent plus level. Um, but the the patterns of voting, the block voting, has been crystal clear for forever. I mean, the Hispanic candidates in Lawrence have. You know, I mean, the Hispanic voters in, in Lawrence have Hispanic candidates to vote for. They vote for them overwhelmingly, um, and they get those. They get very few votes outside of Lawrence. There's a you you drive from Andover into Lawrence. The zoning difference is wild, right? They're just two very different places. I mean, uh, Andover looks like the more uh, rural parts of Belmont, and then all of a sudden you're like in Dorchester. When you cross, uh, I guess it's the Merrimack. Yeah, uh, you cross in the river there. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a, it's a sudden transition. Uh, they're just two different places, and they don't get the Hispanic candidates don't get votes to speak of in Andover um, uh, or, or the other surrounding communities. Um, so we looked at that extremely carefully and concluded, you know what, they have fifty percent plus one. Not not much more than that. But um, it was enough to, um, in our view, mandate that we um, create a, a, a district that was 50% plus one. And we have, did, we have done that. We have grouped Lawrence with Hispanic neighborhoods in Methuen, well, with all of Methuen and Hispanic neighborhoods in Haverhill uh, to create a district that is majority 
Hispanic citizen voting age population. Um, and uh, again, there, I do believe you're gonna see an Hispanic legislator coming down from Lawrence, which will add substantially to, to diversity and really add a different voice. We have not had that kind of Dominican voice in the Senate um, ever. And uh, so that's that's a significant um, new voice. And, and to do that, by the way, we really uh, leaned out of the box in terms of moving some other senators around. And it was a very uncomfortable thing for those senators. And I respect them greatly for um, uh, living with it ultimately. Um, and it, but it was it was a big deal. Um, so we, we, we did the right thing on that. At the end, there was kind of a push from the advocates for us to do something in Brockton, which we really didn't believe we had a voting rights um, case to do. Uh, and we didn't change our mind on that, but we kind of bent a little bit and added some precincts into, Bo into Brockton. So you have a majority people of color district in Brockton, which is not really a thing legally. And I don't think it's a thing politically either, because there's actually you know, contrary to the narrative that, okay, I've got people of color and they're going to vote together because they're quote unquote people of color. Uh, no, there, there are actually some very different um, orientations within that very broad category and they're not necessarily going to vote together. Uh, so we'll we'll see what happens out in Brockton. Um, that'll, that'll be interesting, but that's sort of a kind of a footnote to the big story, which is the, the Boston story and the Lawrence story. Um, other than that, uh, most mostly a sort of, um, nickel and dime politics, uh, political issues that we work through. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there and hope to hope to take some questions. Maybe you could unspotlight me so that I can actually see the other people in the, uh, is there a way I can see the, uh, the others in the, in the audience here? Yes, I think we'll, yeah, first you can, of all, yeah, yes, you we can, can unspotlight. No, no, I'm, you can spot, whatever you want to do, actually. Now, it, it was just on me. I should have done that earlier. You I, I should, gonna, right. You have a gallery view. Yeah, yeah. I could have changed yes. the gallery view. I'm looking yes. at myself the whole time thinking, I, gotta, I, know. I can't tell. I, what I agree. I didn't figure that out until about a quarter of the way through. So yeah. we're all still learning this technology. But yeah. I, you know, I am, it's, it's overwhelming in some ways to hear all of the, um, the intricacies of what you have been working on. Um, I just want to open a general question here to ask, you seem to be still very much excited, enthusiastic about your work. Is that, is that true? Um, do you feel like you still have the energy and enthusiasm to continue that work? Well, I'm, I, I definitely have the energy and enthusiasm to continue the work I'm doing. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I and, and but this issue I remain very interested in. It's over. That's the good news. I, I may never get the opportunity to do this again. No, I'm not going to do this for 10 years. But uh, if I do, I, I'm going to come in with a lot of knowledge. Uh, but because, uh, you know, I had to learn a lot to do this, but it's really been fascinating. And, and uh, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. I mean, it was, I mean, the, there's, you know, the political analysis and the demographic analysis really, really, really was in the weeds. Uh, but, but I think we did it right and got to the right outcomes. And, 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 and you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was conflict. I mean, there was a lot of conflict behind the scenes about how to understand the data. Um, so, um, you know, we got to the right place in both cases, uh, but that was, that was not easy. There was, the, there was kind of the internal struggles and the external uh, conversations as well, but both, both of those were hard. Um, and, it, and it was, um, so it, was, it took all the, whatever skills I've managed to develop over time. So um, anyone would like to ask a question, you can do it in, in several ways. You can either put, raise your hand if you have your screen on. Um, and I see George is over here. Um, and you can certainly go first, but you can also put a question in the chat. So um, you have the mic now, George. Thanks. Uh, George, uh, sorry, Will. <laughs> was, um... Uh, does the ranking choice voting RCV, did you have any kind of sense that it might change the way the district are defined and the packing even for the minority, that it might change drastically? You know what, that's a really deep question. Um, and fortunately, we didn't have to think that through. Uh, I, I guarantee you that would generate, um, you know, whole generations worth of, uh, of um, Academic papers and litigation, uh, if we if we actually had some some voting rights dispute in the rank choice voting context, because I I don't I think the principle the fundamental ideas would be the same, 
but thinking through how those apply when you have voting when you have ranked choice voting I'm I think we'd have to do some work there and I don't I don't know how that would how that would come out because it, it, I, I I off the top of my head I mean the, the the basic principles would remain the same uh, but the analysis see that that ecological inference analysis I think what would be really hard is applying the statistical techniques that have been developed to understand voting patterns to the outcome of ranked choice voting elections. I mean, because you know that that would, you know, if you've got the choices ranked, well, who was the choice of the black voter, the Hispanic voter, the Asian voter? Who was the, or the white voter? Who was who was who? That's what was right. the choice? Yeah, and so I, I I don't know how that all would play out. That's that's. Right. You know, I came from a different planet, from across the pond, and this um, race thing is not something which I'm. It's something that I learned on late and uh, by coming in the U.S. And uh, I, 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 I see this kind of packing. Maybe, maybe actually, maybe we are somewhat wrong in that when we go in RCV, it will not be a matter of having a black district to be able to represent those voters but we will not need to to have that maybe but maybe it's just a wish a way to hope I, I think i think i don't think it's going to change that and ultimately it's still going to be an issue because if you have i mean look at look at it this way if you really had what's called racially polarized voting and you got three black candidates on the ballot and three white candidates, you know, and then if it's really racially polarized to, to, and, and we're using black and white just for example, um, well, then the black voters are gonna vote for the black candidates, the white voters are gonna vote for the white candidates and they're gonna, you know, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, six, one, two, three. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. I, I think if it's, it, I, I'm glad we didn't have to think that through because my mind boggles just uh, starting to try to think it through. Thanks, Wayne. Other questions? I don't see any hands up. Ah, Mark, Mark Davis. Hi, Will. Um, hey, Mark. Uh, from, um, being a mathematician, um, there, there are 160 state reps and 40 state senators and 40 divides into 160 evenly. Why don't you just have the, um, set up the state rep districts and then um, choose four for each um, Senate district, then you don't have to have the have, have them being um, done separately. And, and furthermore, for the US reps, there's nine US reps, which gets you could have um, 18 state rep districts for um, seven of the um, U.S. reps and two would have 17 um, state rep districts, which at least would simplify having, instead of having um, three totally independent, relatively independent, other than they're starting from what happened 10 years ago. Comments? I mean, that's certainly mathematically possible and we, we, could, we could work to that. And I think there's an argument for it. Um, I would personally hate to be stuck with the decisions that the House made. I mean, I um, I like our decision making process. I think I think we drew some pretty clean districts, and um, so I wouldn't want to be because because the they're well, it's their decisions are going to be driven by to some extent by their own politics, um, and. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to get tied to that. Um, I think, and I think probably everybody sort of feels that way. Um, it's just, and there are different dynamics. If, and at the, at the congressional level, of course, you do have this dynamic that they have to be equal sizes. So, but you could address that by splitting just a couple of rep districts in, in the scenario that you construct. Um, so that's not really a, an issue. Um, but I, 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 I prefer, Given the choice, I'd prefer to keep it the way it is because I think we did a nice job in the Senate that uh, reflects um, our needs. And remember this, I mean, I'm not even sure it would turn out that the Voting Rights Act stuff would work. Uh, you know, if, if, if 
even if our constitution mandated what you said, and I think there are some state constitutions that do this, that have nested districts, um, we would be required to, the federal constitution, you know, the Voting Rights Act principles would override those, override those principles. So a lot of the same things that we went through, we would have to, we would, we would do anyway. It wouldn't, it wouldn't obviate our obligation to allow minority voters the candidate of their choice. I don't, and I don't think the nesting of rep districts that allow that would guarantee a Senate district that allowed that. That's an interesting mathematical question that we could, you could, we could contemplate. Um, well, I think, I think Mark will contemplate it with you. I'm not sure that the rest of us will understand it, but uh, we do have another um, hand up and that's from Tony Barnes. Hi, Will. Uh, so first I'd like to apologize for, to everybody for my interruption earlier. That was my fault um, getting on. Um, but just, I, I'm curious, Will, as you've, you've talked about this, it, I, it's been a really interesting topic the last few years. I feel like voting in general, there's a lot more uh, intense connection that people have with the, the mechanics of it now than people did maybe four or six years ago. But one of the things that I've heard a lot about that I, I didn't hear the words as you're going through it very much is sort of the, the party affiliation, how much that is or is not taken into account and, and how that might affect decisions that are made through this process. So you talked a lot about sort of minorities and race, but not a lot about the party affiliation. Um, a, do you feel like that does play a role in the process? And B, are, are there suggestions you have for how we can make this um, an even better process moving forward than, than, than it already was? It sounds like you did a, a great job with it. But... Thank you. Um, well, the interesting thing is Massachusetts just doesn't have enough Republicans to, to make that much of an issue. Um, I, I treated my Republican colleagues, of which there are three out of 40, I treated them exactly the same as I treated my Democratic colleagues. You know, uh, I, we, we engaged in the constitutional analysis and followed the law at that level and then applied continuity concerns um, and We didn't do anything different for for the for the Republican candidates for the Republican senators. Um, there was no need to, and the same is true at the congressional level. Actually, there's a, our, our our friend Moon Duchin, our consultant Moon Duchin, actually had published a paper not too too long ago that that made the 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 conclusion, you know, based on a whole lot of simulation, that it's mathematically impossible to draw a district in Massachusetts that would favor a congressional candidate. Uh, not that you couldn't have a really charismatic congressional, you know, con Republican that might be able to win in some sort of moderate district, um, that could happen. But you won't have a district that tilts Republican um, in Massachusetts. You, you won't be able to do what a lot of other states are doing because there are a significant number of Republicans in Massachusetts. It's not like we're all Democrats, but they're not concentrated. They're spread more or less evenly across the landscape. I mean, they're not spread exactly evenly. There, there, there's big differences. If you go down to you know, the most Republican areas of the state, maybe uh, central Plymouth County, uh, but at the scale of a congressional district, it's hard to carve out um, enough area that's gonna be heavily Republican that for it to be an issue. And in our process, it just wasn't an issue. In fact, towards the end of the process, um, Somebody wanted us, you know, one of our members was upset about their district and they were demanding that we produce, you know, a partisan analysis. He said, look, we're not going to start for all the districts. Uh, he decided his district, he didn't get a good enough deal. He was concerned about the partisan makeup. We certainly, we certainly had a few conversations about the issue, but we did not systematically engage in looking at partisan analysis. We only did it when somebody raised an issue and we had to argue with them about where they were. Uh, and that was only for a few senators. So he was, you know, this guy was demanding we do it for everybody. He said, no, we're not going to start doing that. We just, we're not doing, this is, this was not a partisan process from the beginning and we're not going to end it up as a partisan process either. Um, so from a, we're just very different from other states. We, I, it was funny. I got, I got invited out to um, this conference out in Utah where we were, and the reason we were, I was invited out, this is an on redistricting conference and we were invited out because we had had, we were one of the only states in the last cycle that didn't have any lawsuits. And I said, well, 
ironically, I mean, actually, I wasn't there. I mean, I didn't do it. So, but I'll, uh, I'll come out anyway. Uh, but I, what I had to tell them was, look, we're not geniuses up here. We just don't have any Republicans. We, you know, it's not. There's not. There's nothing. There's nothing worth suing about. We don't. I. I just. I said. I just said it wrong, right? We do have Republicans. We just don't have enough that it's worth the Republican Party's dollars to push push the districts around. Um, so there's just, we don't have that kind of lawsuit here, um, and and we don't have it as part of our process. I'll tell you what we did do from a process standpoint that I think is good, and uh, we got a lot of recognition for. Um, was we tried to include everybody. We really worked hard to uh, include all the advocates of every stripe um, and uh, give them hearings. And I and I not just I didn't just you know get them give them their three minutes in a public hearing, but I met a lot with basically everybody who had an axe to grind. I met with them um, and and talked to them and heard their perspective and to the extent possible or right accommodated their perspective. Um, and I, we, we, the, the, the process that was conducted in 2010 was widely um, acclaimed on that basis, that it was fair and participatory and transparent. And we, we aspired to meet or surpass that. And, and the observers basically told us, yeah, you did. I mean, you, you took it to another level. You did a good job with, with participation. And hopefully that, that perception uh, re, you know, remains the perception. Um, knock on wood. Um, it's 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 only January. I suppose something could somebody could take a different perspective still. But I, I feel like we we might we're I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm not I'm not too worried about what we've done getting getting challenged down. Other questions, Mark? Sorry, sorry for a second question, but. Um... People may have noticed in the news, and I'm interested in your um, reaction, Will, to Alabama's um, redistricting was um, uh, rejected by a three-judge panel, I think, and it's going to the Supreme Court because they, um, Alabama is 25% African-American. They have uh, seven U.S. reps, and um, the they pa it's a packed um, Black district so that they only get one rep, they don't have a chance for doing two. And um, your um, trend professor, Moon um, Duchess, um, drew up for the plaintiffs, um, drew up four congressional um, districting, redistricting plans that would provide a competitive uh, black district as well as the um, fairly heavily black district, and that's going to the Supreme Court because Alabama doesn't doesn't. Or the Republicans in Alabama don't like that they can't force themselves to have six Republican representatives. Yeah, I mean, I I actually haven't read much about it, and so I don't have an opinion on it. But it sounds like you've given a good summary of the issues. Okay, well, uh, any other questions? Uh, sure, Will. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, last, a couple of months ago, there was a, some things that we read in the news that I didn't fully understand, and that had to do with New Bedford and Fall River. Oh, and yeah. Those two towns would be divided for a con congressional district. Yes. You know, I just wondered if you had comments on that or if you could kind of help me understand what was going on down there. Well, to be honest, uh, my co-chair, I mean, I'm the Senate chair, and then we have a House chair, and, you know, we we do we each, I do the Senate maps, he does the House maps, and then we do the congressional maps together, and the two of us really never could quite figure out what was going on down there. Uh, you had a very, um, there was no Voting Rights Act issue down there. Some people were saying, oh, well, you know, we want you to group Fall River with New Bedford so that you can create a Portuguese district. Well, first of all, no, we don't do that. We, you know, you don't, you don't create a Portuguese district. You don't create an Irish district. That's unconstitutional. That's, those are suspect ca categories and uh, they're not authorized under the Voting Rights Act. There's no way we're going to do that. So to the extent they were making that argument for grouping Fall River with New Bedford is like, no, can't do it. And, um, but you know there are other arguments. So if there are other reasons, and people, you, you can have reasonable people can differ as to whether Fall River and New Bedford 
must should be together. I would point out that they are about as close as Belmont and Framingham. I mean, it's it's quite a ways from from Fall River to New Bedford. It's, I mean, from from a Boston perspective, you sort of throw them, you know, you say those words to, together fairly frequently, uh, but they're really pretty far apart, and uh, they have different histories and industries. And reasonable people can differ on whether they belong together, and reasonable people did differ. You had the whole power structure of Fall River saying we want to be on our own, and you had the whole power structure of New Bedford saying. Uh, we think Fall River should be with us because we want to work together. Um, and so I, uh, and, you know, at a grassroots level, there was some organization that said they should be together, but it really was not too strong. And Congressman Alkenkloss wanted Fall River in his district. He wanted to take, you know, he wanted the whole, previously Fall River was split between Congressman um, Keating and Congressman Alkenkloss. Alkenkloss, they, they, Fall River wanted to be unsplit. They wanted to be unified. Alkenkloss wanted it, Keating wanted it. We ended up putting it with Alkenkloss, but uh, you know, reasonable people could differ on it. It, it, it was, it was, it was the, the most heated issue. I mean, something always has to blow up, right? Um, and it was, but I was, I was really, we were really surprised that that was the hot thing. I good, thank you, thank you. I don't see any other hands up. So um, I think we'll, we have learned an enormous amount of, uh, of what you have been doing in the last several years. And uh, we really appreciate the fact that you've been willing and eager to spend your time. I feel, I feel personally that um, we are in good hands with you. And, Thank um, you. So we are, you know, I, I'd say a round of applause for sharing all of that information. And Thank you. Any, we'd love to have you come back anytime. Isn't that true, Debbie and Nicole, right? Indeed. Yes. Okay. Well, bring me back when I'll, I'll, I'll next time I have something new to talk about. We're working on, uh, we're working on correctional spending now. So what we can talk about that in another, in another session sometime. Okay, great. Good. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for having me, good night to all. Nice to see everybody.